So you all told me that you wanted to learn about linked data, and I'm excited to talk about it because I think it's actually kind of fun to think about. So in this video, I'm going to try and explain what it is and what you need to know about it. And when we're done, you won't be able to build a linked data application or anything, but you should be able to understand what people are talking about when they talk about linked data. So the first thing to know about linked data in the cultural heritage domain is that it's sometimes abbreviated as LODLAM, or Linked Open Data for Libraries, Archives, and Museums, which is kind of fun to say. And linked data, just like virtual reality, is not really one piece of technology, but a set of best practices for publishing data on the web. To understand what it is, let's say you're managing a database at your museum. Now the artist in the center here created these three paintings and we'll, we'll represent that relationship with those lines there. If I were to query my database, I could find out that a painter created three paintings. But let's say that while I know this is true for the paintings in my collection, it's not really true for the painter's actual career because I know that in fact the artist has another two paintings at the Pink Museum and another three paintings at the Blue Museum. So if there were a way for me to query not just my database, but everybody's database, I could receive the correct answer, 8, if I posed that question to the expanded database. But now let's zoom in on an individual painting. And just like the artist has metadata about her, the painting has metadata about it, too. For example, it's a landscape, it's an oil painting, and it was painted in 1949. And every painting in our database is going to have information like that attached to it. Now, because we know these things not only about our artists, but about our paintings, we can pose even more complex queries to the database. So ask the database a question, and it traverses our graph, first finding the artist we're talking about, then all the paintings, and then only those paintings that were painted in oil. One, two. And we can capture other information about our artist, too. For example, we could record that she's an American woman who was born in 1920. And just like we've done before with the paintings, we'll express those relationships with these little lines, forming a kind of network graph. And if we build our network properly, imagine that any individual entity, like the entity that represents the nationality of being American, can be pointed to by other entities. So our graph has one entity that represents the property of being American, and a number of artists also possess that same property, just like our original artist. And just like the artist in the corner has the property of being American, she also has the property of being female. So she'll point to that property, the same one our first painter painted to, in addition to the property of being American. And the guy at the bottom is going to point to the property of being born in 1920, because that's when he was born. So now our graph is getting increasingly interconnected and a little bit more confusing to look at, um, especially if we were to add the paintings back into our graph. But even though I have trouble representing it, we could, in theory, keep building our graph out and building it out and building it out, incorporating more artists, more paintings, more sculptures, more nationalities, media, etc., and perhaps even linking people and paintings to architecture, locations, and on and on and on. And then if I wanted to, I could ask increasingly complex questions of the database and get back accurate answers. This is actually a relatively simple query, but you could imagine them being much more complicated. And so this is the great dream of linked open data, to join together more and more knowledge into a giant cloud-based graph that anyone can query. And this would allow people to ask questions and see relationships they've never been able to before. So when people talk about linked open data, this is the dream that they're referring to. So that's the big dream. But before we get more into linked data, I want to back up and go over various kinds of data that exist in the world. Um, when we worked with data together, remember that it was in a spreadsheet, aka a table. Well, logically enough, data that's arranged in that way is also known as tabular data. And tables do have some really good things about them. 
They're relatively easy to read, to create, and to query. And if you want to, you can even link them to other tables to create what's called a relational database. But tables also have drawbacks. Because let's say you wanted to add a property to your table after you'd already entered a bunch of information. Well, you'd have to go back and change the entire thing. And it's not so easy, easy to isolate different parts of your data uh, and create special relationships that exist only for those particular entities. You have to treat all of your data in more or less the same way. Well, another way you could set up your data is as a hierarchy. So in this model, everything is part of a subset of something else, kind of like the way a tree branches off um, from a trunk. And you may already have worked with data like this if you've dealt with EAD, or encoded archival description. Um, and it makes sense in that context. Like you start with a collection, and then underneath that you have a box, and inside that you have a folder, and inside the folder you have documents, and then you have various parts of specific documents. So hierarchical data is great when you want to express tree-like relationships, um, like in an archive. But of course, not every kind of information can be expressed in that way. There may not be a natural hierarchy to put your data into. Now, linked data is the other kind of data, the kind of data we're talking about today. So in this model, every entity exists independently of other entities, and we draw links between them to show that they're related. And this allows you to keep adding to your graph as much as you want, to change parts of it without invalidating other parts, and to be very flexible in terms of the kind of information you capture. Even if you're not capturing the same information as someone else, you can still link your graph to theirs as long as you share some nodes in common. Now this kind of data has a name. Um, each fact in your linked data set is expressed as a statement, kind of like a sentence, called an RDF triple. RDF stands for Resource Description Framework, but that's not really important to remember. RDF triples are called triples because they have three parts, and they work kind of like a sentence. They have a subject, a predicate, and an object. So for example, one triple we could write would be a painter painted a nice day. We have two nouns, a painter and a nice day, and then we have them connected by a verb, which is our predicate, painted. And you could create more and more statements like this, all independent of each other, as long as they conform to this subject predicate object pattern. And as you build your graph out, it will look something like this. And notice how um, every relationship here can be expressed as a triple. So Picasso influenced Jeff Koons would be one statement. Jeff Koons created puppy is another statement. Puppy resides at the Guggenheim, and Guggenheim is lo located in Bal Bilbao. Maybe you can uh, intuit that the graph is just a visual representation of the data, which is in fact stored as a bunch of statements or triples. Now, if we want our graph to actually be meaningful, we need to also build in some safeguards. For example, what if every time someone wanted to use the property female, they created their own instance of the property instead of all pointing at the same element. Well, this would be useless for the purpose of querying. We wouldn't be able to count how many female artists are out there because we wouldn't know which female entity is the one to use. Well, the solution is to have one instance of female that everybody points to. And as you might know, these authorized terms, the terms that everybody has agreed to use, are called authorities. You can have one authorized female property, and everyone who wants to be associated with femaleness has to point to that one entity. You can't just invent your own whenever you want. And of course, it's the same thing with things like countries or dates. So these are authorities that everybody has agreed to use. So how is an authority denoted? Well, every authority has something called a URI, or Universal Resource Identifier. And this is a specific number or sequence of characters that belong to it and only it. For example, the Virtual International Authority file, um, which we looked at briefly when we talked about the MoMA data, is actually a list of authorities. And if you look closely, you can see that Picasso has his very own VF ID that belongs only to him. 
And that way, anyone can use that number and be confident that they're talking about the same Picasso as everyone else. So for example, in our graph, every artist would have a URI, every painting would have a URI, and even every kind of relationship would have a URI. So those, those have URIs as well. Those predicates have URIs. And in this case, um, we would probably use the URI for the term creator, um, a set of relationships that's maintained by Dublin Core, which you might already be familiar with. So that means that a triple would look something like this. Um, this one means that the artwork puppy was created by the artist Jeff Koons. And now you may have noticed that URIs look a lot like URLs. And many times they actually are URLs, meaning they like point to an actually existing page on the internet. It's nice when this is the case, but it's not always the case. And a disclaimer that if you actually look at LOD triples, they'll look a little different from this, as I explain in the qualifications and clarification section of this video. But what they're expressing is exactly this subject, predicate, object, um, all expressed in universal resource identifiers. So a linked database looks like a bunch of triples, one after the other. And often that kind of database is called a triple store. So if you hear someone talking about a triple store, that's what they're talking about, a database that's specifically built to hold RDF triples. But of course, in order for a database to be useful, we need to be able to ask it questions. And the language that we use to query triple stores is called Sparkle, which apparently stands for Sparkle Protocol and RDF Query Language, but everyone just says Sparkle. So just like you may have heard of SQL, which is the language you use to query a relational database, Sparkle is the language you use to query a triple store. Sparkle queries are written something like this. You look for all the paintings and then narrow in on only those paintings that are created in oil. And do you see how the query moves along the graph until it locates only those entities that have been specified? And of course, because the queries are computerized, they traverse the graph really, really quickly. So while it may take you a long time to find the right entities, a computer can return uh, results almost instantaneously. Now, if you're looking for a book in the library, you'd go to a library catalog to enter your search terms. And that's kind of like what a Sparkle endpoint is. It's a way to get into that triple store to ask your question. And a Sparkle endpoint will look something like this. So the problem is, if you're going to go ask your question at a Sparkle endpoint, how are you supposed to know what kinds of questions you can ask? That is to say, what kinds of relationships can you expect the data set to contain? Well, those relationships are dictated by an ontology, which is another term that you'll hear frequently in relation to linked open data. A linked open data ontology tells you which kinds of relationships you are allowed to use in your linked data. And different domains of knowledge have different ontologies, like biology would have its own ontology, um, natural history would have its own ontology. And the ontology that you'll hear most frequently referred to when you're talking about museums is called CDOC CRM, which apparently stands for the Conceptual Reference Model of the International Committee for Documentation of the International Council of Museums, but everybody just calls it the CDOC CRM. And as ICOM explains on its website, it is intended to be a common language for domain experts and implementers to formulate information systems and serve as a guide for good practice of conceptual modeling. So that's where museums most widely used ontology comes from, this international committee. So now you can actually relax a little bit because I've covered the main stuff that you need to know about linked data. So here's the takeaway points that you need to remember. Linked data expresses relationships in triples. Whenever possible, every entity is going to have a URI. And the allowable relationships in every domain are contained in a map called an ontology.
CDOC CRM is probably the most important ontology to know about in the museum domain. And you can query a linked open database, sometimes called a triple store, with the Sparkle query language at a Sparkle endpoint. So if you understand all of those statements, then you should be good to go. You actually understand the most important things there are to know about linked data in, um, in museums, and you should be able to follow most conversations about linked data. But you know, at the beginning, I called linked open data a dream. And at this point, you might be wondering how close we are to realizing that dream. So I would say that we are not really that close. Which is not to say that um, there aren't important developments. There are consortia of museums that have developed a cloud of linked museum data. Um, there are a lot of people who are really passionate about linked data. And there are a lot of people who have made it like their careers to work on realizing the dream of linked open data. But to turn a museum's regular relational database into linked open data is a lot of work. Um, and we've seen in this class how a lot of museums just do not have the extra time or resources that they would need to do this work. So it's hard to imagine linked data being a big priority at a time like this when museums are really struggling just to keep their doors open. Which is not to say, you know, that it's not important to keep following the conversation. The dream is very much still alive and there is an international summit every year. And it's worth looking at the notes from these meetings to get a sense of how people are thinking about Laudlam right now. So that actually might cover everything you want to know about linked data, in which case, congratulations. You should now be able to carry on an informed conversation about Laudlam. But in case you're curious, stick around for a couple of qualifications and clarifications of stuff I didn't want to bog you down with earlier. So when we were talking about how triples are expressed, I mentioned that they may not look exactly like what I showed on the screen. And that's because there are different ways of writing down these statements. And these different formats are called serializations. A serialization is just a specific way of writing data. For example, the spreadsheet we looked at together from MoMA was serialized as a CSV, um, or a comma-separated value spreadsheet. And there are a lot of different serializations of RDF data. Some names you might hear are RDF XML, Turtle, RDFA, N triples, and JSON LD. I won't get into all the differences between these serializations, but just be aware that they exist and there are some differences. And also, if you hear someone talking about turtles, they're not talking about the aquatic animal, probably. And then the one last thing I wanted to point out is that not all open data is linked and not all linked data is open. And we saw an example of open data um, that is not linked when we use the spreadsheet from MoMA. The data is freely available, so it's open, but it's not expressed as RDF triples, so it's not considered linked. And of course, linked databases exist that are not open to everyone. Just that like there are a lot of databases where you have to pay to use them. So I think this should actually get you pretty far in carrying out a conversation about linked open data. You should be able to annotate this video with your questions or just bring them to class on Friday and I'll be happy to do my best to answer them. Have a good week.